All right, welcome to lecture eight, X Query and DTD. My name is David Malin, and why don't we begin in reverse order tonight, uh, talking for a moment about Project Three. So fortunately, we did for the most part the walkthrough of Project Three a couple of weeks ago now, because recall that really the only aspects of Project Three that were perhaps inaccessible, at least so far as lecture material has gone, uh, was the um, stuff related to DTD. So tonight, actually, we're going to re uh, reveal those particular details, and then you're off on your way with Project 3 in its entirety. Um, recall that the Project 3 is all about Wahoo. Hopefully, you'll find it fun and that you're actually going to integrate some real-world data sources, specifically from moreover.com, which is that syndicator of content. Uh, it is equivalent in spirit to integrating any of these so-called RSS feeds these days. And in fact, let me begin with a question. RSS, what is it? Ooh, okay, yeah? Standard. A standard, okay. You got one of the letters. A uh, standard for, oh, uh, Simple, uh, Simple, okay, we're doing it in reverse order. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> real simple syndication. Yeah, oh, it's re really simple really syndication. Simple. So it actually has a few different expansions. I think people have decided to change what it means over the years. In the end of the day, most people just call it RSS, but really simple syndication actually works pretty well. RSS is just an XML file, and it's structured in a certain way according to an XML schema, which essentially has inside of it a channel element, as you might see, uh, and zero or more item elements. In fact, Apple, for its podcast format, uh, usurped this notion of RSS, presumably because it was already a standard and their software that already knows how to read it. And if I go ahead, just for kicks here, to, and pull up our website, and go to our podcast link, not to focus on the videos or audio files in there, but on how we publish them, you'll notice that there's always been this RSS link here. And if we click this, Internet Explorer, unfortunately, since I have version 7 on here, is going to uh, hide all of the details of this file, and it's going to display it in a nice, pretty format. <clears throat> Odds are what IE is using is some form of XSLT style sheet, or maybe some other built-in routine. But in theory, they could have just applied a style sheet uh, to the XML file that is our podcast's feed. So what I'll instead do is take this view and go into our own account, and we keep things tucked away in our podcast directory in a file called index.xml. Um, we've configured our account so that index.xml is much like index.html, and that the server assumes it's the default file. And what you'll see in this thing is there's an XML declaration. Here's an RSS root element. Here's some of that XML NS stuff, because what Apple has done is they've actually extended the definition of RSS or integrated their own definitions into an RSS feed, and they've added their own tags. And the means by which you can do this most seamlessly is to just use your own namespace, and thus your own namespace prefix. So unfortunately, I'm getting a little chopped off here on the side, but we see almost everything. Um, in RSS are a number of optional and required fields, and among those fields are tags like uh, channel, which describes in general the content in this feed, uh, title, description, a link to the official site, the language, the copyright information, the author, the summary. But notice now I'm already in these red tags in the iTunes specific tags. So Apple decided to just insert their own information so that programs like iTunes can read not only the generic RSS, but also this iTunes specific information. And presumably what this means is that podcast feeds can be read with off-the-shelf software by programs other than iTunes just because they happen to understand RSS. And this additional meta information is really just for iTunes and maybe other programs' benefits. But let's just scroll down to the first lecture and notice that the convention I've taken just to try to keep things as clean as possible within our feed is to give things a title like this, to put in brackets the type of file, and then I have a link here, and it scrolls off the side of the screen, but that goes to dot, 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 I think lecture1.mp3, thereby referencing the file. Down here we have some information, because RSS allows you to specify that each item has an enclosure that is an actual file associated with it. And long story short, it's not too hard to infer from these tags what they're all doing. But the point, for today's purposes, is that here's an RSS feed. And simply having skills like XSLT, knowing something about XPath queries tonight, knowing something about XQuery in examples, can you parse this information and do stuff with it? Um, by arguably the most common use for RSS feeds is for syndication, not just of AV content, 
but of news. So a site that I actually frequent a lot, albeit via the web and not bar via RSS, is a hardware site called Engadget. It's one of these slash dot like sites. And you'll notice that almost every damn site these days has an RSS feed. And you know, the good thing is that that often makes it easy to get at the information. Um, and the funny thing is that it's so trivial to syndicate your website or your data as RSS. In fact, if I click this, let's see what happens. So again, IE is hiding some of the details here for me, but this is rendering now what's an RSS feed. Let's take a more traditional approach. Actually, can, let me see if I can view source. Yeah, so if I just view source here, notice that this is not H, well, a bit of a white lie. This is not really HTML, but rather this is one big RSS file. Turns out you can embed X, uh, HTML within an RSS file. In fact, how, what's the safest way to generally embed HTML or XHTML within an XML file, which RSS is an instance of? Yeah, C data. So if you want to be careful about escaping of characters and you don't want the parser to choke on the input, especially if it's non-well-formed HTML, that is, you don't have those closed brackets for every one of your open brackets, or closed tags for every one of your open tags, you might want to escape that. But long story short, this is what Engadget's spitting back to my browser, and my browser just has a default style sheet of some sort that's rendering that information. And the neat thing is that these days, you don't even have to interface with XML via XSLT or XPath or the like, but you can do it through more traditional languages. In fact, for some of my other courses, I've taken to using XML still for configuration files, using my own homegrown configuration format, but then I just use PHP to iterate over the XML as though it were one big object that just has child after child after child, and you can do it all in code, even without these so-called location paths. So that's the cool thing, frankly, about XML these days, is that it's obviously human readable, it's obviously easy to generate, but there's a lot of different ways of getting at the information. And even I, increasingly, far more so than when I started teaching this course a few years ago, I mean, can tend to default most things I do to using XML in some form, at least for quick and dirty tasks, like whipping up websites or just getting jobs done and doing it easily. So with that said, where did we leave off last time? So we looked uh, at hopefully what was new to some of you with this environment of all things server side, looking at HTTP and answering questions like, who cares that we're using it? Well, we have cookie mechanisms, which allow us to implement what notion did we say in, uh, at a programming level? Yeah, this idea of a session, whereby you, oh, state. state, exactly. So cookies allow you to maintain state, even as a user's laptop migrates from T-Mobile's network to Verizon's network to Comcast's network and the like by storing some bit of unique information about you that the server can then correlate with some in-memory variables. And the beautiful thing about Java Servlet, as we saw, is that it's so darn easy to use a session object when building web-based um, software just by instantiating a session object and plopping things in it by way of uh, key value pairs. And you can assume that they will be returned to you, assuming the user doesn't go about clearing their cookies. All right, so we talked in general about this framework of N-tier enterprise applications. Not so much because it's fundamentally interesting, I think, given that at the end of the day it's just jargon, but it at least sort of set the stage for the type of framework that we were going to look at for Wahoo. Uh, talked about JSPs briefly, but more so on Java Servlet did we spend our time, and we'll continue to do more of that for Project 4, and then we, of course, introduced Project 3. So this was the... Um, typical J2EE architecture that we put forth. Perhaps more germane was that for Wahoo specifically. And recall that your focus, if not already, is going to be on the pref servlet and the view servlet. That we do urge you to understand and poke, poke around these other classes like user manager and news provider to see how we're getting the job done. In fact, we abstracted away the details of getting data from moreover.com just so that you could focus more on the logic of the website as opposed to the lower level details like fetching the data via some socket connection. But all of it's going to be live data that you're pulling in from moreover. So your portal will change visually day by day. All right, so today, xQuery. So xQuery uh, is a recommendation as of January 2007, and it's increasingly being supported by a lot of popular software. So there's not support, I don't believe, just yet in 
say, the Xerces Zalin packages that we've been downloading, but Saxon, which is a popular alternative by Michael Kay, does support XQuery now. Uh, XML Spy, I believe, has a built-in XQuery engine, um, and a lot of popular uh, database management systems like Oracle and others also support XQuery as a, quite simply, a language via which you can pull data from the database. It is very similar in spirit to XPath. In fact, it is XPath 2.0 plus more. So XPath 2.0, which is also a recommendation, is a subset of XQuery. And there's a lot of interrelationships among XQuery and XSLT2 and uh, XPath2 because the working groups, even though technically distinct, um, shared a lot of their ideas, data models, so that there's definitely overlap among them. But the best analogy, perhaps, or at least the most common analogy, is that XQuery is to XML as SQL is to a relational database. It allows you to query data in a manner that's conceptually consistent with how that data is structured. So. Uh, with that said, let's take a look at a few of the basics of XQuery and XPath. We won't dwell too much on it, only because the existing infrastructure that we've been using, uh, Apache stuff and so forth, doesn't really have um, robust support for this just yet, at least off the shelf. Um, but increasingly, I think, will you find this to be an option, say, in your own environments or in traditional database systems. Uh, so a teaser, if anything, as to how this all works. So XQuery also supports, and please interrupt at any point with questions, uh, path expressions. So more of a generalization of those location paths. And effectively what you can do, if, and incidentally I've linked to a few uh, additional references, namely the W3Schools, which is a wonderful resource for this and other things as we've seen this semester, how you might get at data in a file called books.xml. So much like we saw the XPath document function, whereby you could open up a separate document within a style sheet and reference it by way of a variable name, the idea with XQuery is that at least if you're pulling the data from a flat file, you can simply call doc in the file name and then begin accessing it via location path via um, uh, its root element followed by its child or children and so forth. So at this point in the course, it's probably obvious conceptually as to what's going on here. Perhaps the in most interesting one here, oh, let's look at the last two. Uh, in English, the last bullet there, the last query, what's that going to select in an English phrase? Okay, good. So even more precise than, than I was even expecting, but sure, all books less than 50 bucks, right? So, or whatever the unit of measure here is. What about the one just above that? What's that going to select? The one involving title. All the titles. All the titles. Be slightly more specific, though. All the titled children. All the titled children, but really all the titled descendants anywhere in the document. So the slash slash, just to do a bit of review, and clearly this is borrowing from XPath 1.0. Um, what did that? What was that shorthand for? The sorry, descendant or just to be very picky or self, right? That was that hyphenated axis, descendant or self, which just meant everywhere. The catch, of course, let's push back on ourselves, is what when you use an axis like that? It can be very inefficient. It uh, can be very inefficient. Yeah, inefficient because. Presumably, you're searching the entire tree to find any and all elements that go by the name of title. So more typically, the more specific queries are better unless your engine has done some kind of pre-processing, which in that case doesn't seem to have been the case. So the neat, if perhaps most uh, basic construct in XQuery is the so-called flower expression. So they actually did a pretty good job at coming up with a cute way of summing up the notion of XQuery with this acronym. So the means by which you typically query data is by way of a flower expression. And the neat thing about flower expressions is that unlike uh, paths in, a, uh, in the sense we just looked at them, they allow you to implement a bit of logic now in your query. So this is where you see a uh, similar spirit with SQL, whereby you can order, order the data that's returned. Uh, you can do where's and such, and you can have temporary results returned, uh, temporary uh, um, subqueries, for instance. So the general, the grammar, if you will, for flower expression is as follows. A one or more for or let clauses, followed by a where clause, uh, optionally, followed by an ordered by clause, optionally, 
followed by return, literally, followed by uh, in a single expression. So it's perhaps easiest to elaborate on these with examples, but just by those names alone, it clearly seems to be the case that we have some more uh, expressiveness with xQuery than we do with just, say, XPath. So what do these things look like? Well, with xQuery, can you uh, execute queries like this? And let me set the stage here by saying the goal or at least the motivation for some of these examples is to return XML elements of interest to us from some document, meeting some criteria. Okay, So this expression here, and again, the nice thing about xQuery is that it is particularly human readable, dare say more so than SQL, at least to someone um, less uh, versed in that. Uh, so for x in doc, so that's inducing some kind of logical loops, whereby we're going to iterate over all of the which elements? So all of the book elements calling iteratively each x. Uh, we're going to limit the books to those whose price is greater than 50. Uh, we're going to order those books by way of their title. And what we're ultimately going to return is the title. So could one summarize that in just an English sentence? What's ultimately returned? All the book titles. Yeah, whose price is greater than 50 bucks. So the titles of books that are more than $50 is the uh, implication of that. And what that's effectively returning then is a node set of sorts. Because we're returning dollar sign $x title, where title is, of course, an element. If we assume that this is coming, incidentally, I was remiss in not even showing you what this file looked like. Well, let me get myself off the hook by saying books.xml contains a bunch of books in a manner that would be reasonable for representing books, as implied by some of these queries. I'll leave it at that for now, um, but we'll take a look at it, uh, a similar example in a bit. So this is ultimately returning dollar sign $x title, but because this is a loop, that implies that there presumably could be multiple such things returned in the spirit of a node set. So similar in spirit to what a location path might have done. Well now, I went the wrong direction. I should have showed you this one first. So here is, and actually this is excerpted from the actual W3C's uh, X query recommendation. It's the example they use in their own rec for discussing the features of xQuery. Uh, here's an example of a bibliography of sorts. In this bibliography is a book called TCPIP Illustrated, another called Advanced Unix Programming, and another one called Data on the Web. Um, perhaps worth noting is that the publisher is the same for the first two books. The third book doesn't seem to have a publisher. Uh, the third book does have three authors, though. But the first book and second have one author who happens to be the same. I'm just pointing out some salient features there. But they use this again for the point of discussion. So now consider this, because this also is a flower expression. And notice this intermingling, for better or for worse, of excuse me, actual raw XML content, so explicit instanti uh, instantiation of nodes, intermingled with logic. So this ultimately is going to return what kind of element? Take a guess. I'm sorry? All so you're, you're diving too deep. Just literally, if what is going to be handed back to me, the caller? What kind of node? Author An author list node. So an element by the name of author list. And to be sure, it's going to have some descendants, it appears, based on all of that logic. But because this whole expression is flanked with auth list and close auth list, the implication is that all I'm going to get back is one node with zero or more descendants. Yeah? Good question. So how does this work? Where does this work? Um, the shorter answer is that it depends. So I believe in XML Spy, for instance, when you're developing, um, and XML Spy is, you can use xQuery queries within it to develop, um, uh, to develop data sets. But say in the context of a database system, you would put these in a file, for instance. These could be the contents of some variable that gets executed against the database. It really depends. Um, if the application that you are writing is designed to uh, pull out XML data, which would make sense, otherwise there's little use to using this in the first place, whatever system you happen to be using would provide you with means of including this. So it might be quite similar in spirit to XSLT, where it's just one big file, where maybe much of it is XML markup with flower expressions nested within, and your XQuery processor's purpose in life is to process exactly that kind of document. 
Um, in the context of XML Spy, you'll instead execute this kind of query in a window, but I would put forward that that's more of a nice sandbox environment for experimenting, say, with these expressions. But short answer is it depends. Sure, so that could certainly be the case. Or you can liken it, even though it's a bit unwieldy as we've structured things here, I mean, the fact of the matter is SQL queries are often just embedded in actual source code. And you could similarly do something like this, especially if it's not XML, literal XML that you're trying to return, but rather data objects. So in the previous example, we didn't have it flanked with this auth list open and close tag, but rather we got back the conceptual notion of a node list, which in Java or some other language could be represented with in-memory objects, which get returned, in which case this would seem a little less weird in the context of actual source code, like, say, Java code. So in, in fact, I don't have examples with me today of how Saxon is used, but if you're particularly curious, Saxon's a good place to start to pull it up and take a look at uh, some examples that it might have on Saxon's use of X queries, because it might help contextualize it. So. Uh, so what's that logic going on inside this tag? Well, for A in, so here we have the notion already of functions, a few more functions than existed in XPath1. Uh, function distinct values, which is going to select all the distinct authors. So this is neat. Uh, how many of you struggled with figuring out how to select in problem sets past distinct nodes according to their value? I mean, there's this sort of crazy hack where you can use the preceding axis or the following axis to do filtration, but it's certainly non-obvious. And it's arguably not all that efficient to take that approach, though the non-obvious factor is perhaps the nail in the coffin. Well, with this and with perhaps other extension functions, can you just select the distinct values? So we're going to get an iteration over all the unique authors. Uh, we're going to order them by the author's name. And ultimately, we're going to return the following chunk of code for each of those iterations. An authors followed by a name child, followed by the text. So here we have the equivalent of um, like an attribute value um, uh, uh, template, attribute value template like we saw in XSLT, where we're inserting the value of text, uh, the text value of that author, that is Stevens, for instance, his name followed by a list of that author's book. So now we're going to do some cross-referencing effectively, where we iterate now over all of the books, book elements anywhere in the data set whose author child equals the current author being iterated over. So what this means is go iterate all over all of Stephen's books, which in the case of the example we just saw is going to be the first two books, and order those by their title and return their title. So in short, what we're going to get back for each of the authors in that file is an author element with his name and then a list of the titles of his books, and that which is what ultimately should be returned. And so what we see, and it's a bit small here, but this too is just taken from the recommendation, if you'd like to pull it up as well, is this precisely this auth list followed by author, 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 author. But the authors are unique because of that function we applied. So even though Stevens had two books, it's just Stevens and those three other guys ultimately. Yeah. Hmm, books. Uh, the books was somehow initialized to have what? Sorry? Oh, this here? Oh, okay. So I'm sorry. Out of context, uh, dollar sign books is simply referring to this file. Or specifically, yeah, that file. So its author element is descendant or self on, along that axis. So go find all of the authors in this particular example. So in, for small files, not a big deal to search the whole thing, but I think they do it really for the sake of simplicity in their own example. OK, so now there's this notion also of sequence expressions, where you actually can save state on each iteration uh, in the following sense. So now suppose that there's some file that lists, uh, let me see if I included this too. Uh, no, so that's OK. Um, so now assume that. We're considering some file called departments.xml, which has uh, effectively a list of departments, and then some other file called emps or employees.xml that somehow associates employees with uh, department elements. So they, the two together implement a corporate database of sorts. So what this example is doing for us by way of the so-called sequence expression is the following. Iterate over all of the department numbers in the first file. On each iteration, initialize this temporary variable e 
to equal the result of grabbing the employee from this file who's in that department. So that could be zero or more such employees, presumably, conceptually. So where count e is greater than or equal to 10. So now I need to qualify what I just said. This is going to store in e a node set of all employee elements so long as what is the case? So this expression here is going to tuck away in E all employee elements in that department from that file so long as what is true? Departments greater than or equal to 10. Right. So in other words, select all of the employees in this department if it's a big department. That is, it has 10 or more employees. So that's all that filter is doing for us. It's going to order, this is neat, order by the average salary of employees in a descending order. And what we're going to return is the following. And now this tag sort of implies what we're doing here. Return a big, each of the big departments in this flat file database, whereby each department should be returned as D, which again was just its department number. So that element's going to get inserted here. The head count, whereby we can count the size of that node set that we tucked away in E. And then we can compute the average salary of those employees um, by simply averaging over each element in E's salary elements. So in short, this returns a list of zero or more big department nodes. And those nodes are sorted from the highest paid department to the lowest paid department. And the catch is that each of those departments has at least 10 employees. So again, so much more logic, so much more expressiveness than we've seen, say, in the context of XSLT alone. So a couple other features, just to give you a sense of what you can do with this language. Well, conditional expressions. So you can implement this notion of if then else. If we want to iterate over all of the so-called holdings in a file called library.xml, we can return a holding element, if you will, that's going to contain that holdings title. And then optionally, if the type's a journal, go ahead and output the editor. Otherwise, just output the author of that holding. So pretty self-explanatory as to how you might use something like this, if of interest. And then finally, there's this notion of quantified expressions. So this is neat in that it becomes even more expressiveness, but I think this will be the last such uh, teaser we give. So for each of the books in that bib.xml file, what we're going to do this time is we want to only select those books where it's the case that there's some p in the book that is some paragraph that satisfies the following conditions. All right, so either the condition that the paragraph contains sailing and the paragraph contains windsurfing. So what does this mean if we take a step back? This is going to iterate over all books whereby each book must have at least one paragraph citing both sailing and windsurfing in the same paragraph. So the presumption is that I want to get back books that are clearly about sailing and windsurfing because they're so obviously about sailing and windsurfing that they go so far as to mention both in some same paragraph within each. So arbitrary example to be sure, but it illustrates how you can impose this notion of sum in this case, a quantified expression. By contrast, if we really are only interested in sailing books, we can impose the requirement by way of the every expression that I want to select all books where every paragraph in those books mentions somewhere the word sailing, and then return those titles instead. So just a way of quantifying, uh, doing text searching, uh, um, ultimately and within these files. Yeah, question? Uh, yeah. So some, so some is really a test in this case. So it's this line here that induces a loop over all these book elements. But we only, because of the second line, iterate over those book elements where it's true that there's some p in that book, that is, some paragraph in that book that satisfies the following conditions. Uh, sorry? Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, some just means uh, one or more, where every obviously means all. Okay. No, so what this is doing is in one liner is, an, is checking all of the paragraphs in B 
and if it finds one, uh, rather, this is, this is uh, effectively inducing a, an inner loop here, where it's iteratively assigning to P each of the paragraphs in B and checking that that paragraph contains both this and that. And as soon as it finds one, it breaks out of that conceptual loop and proceeds to return the title because some book or uh, some paragraph has satisfied those conditions. So some means one or more. Yeah. You said it breaks if if it finds multiple paragraphs. So does the sum will then will it break out then immediately? Is it like as soon as you find one? An efficient X query processor should break out of this loop that I'm using for discussion sake here. Um, just verbally, because the moment you find one paragraph that mentions both sailing and windsurfing, why bother searching the other? So an intelligent processor would break out of that, that search process. But it may not find something else. Correct. And if it doesn't, then it's not going to return any such titles. So it returns the, an empty node set. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Let's finish with this and we'll come. Within the scope of the flower expression, are all of these things valid? So before and after, no longer the case. You so you well yes, and we saw this by way of the let expression. So when we had these sequence expressions, where we're inducing a sequence of um, operations. So yes, in that sense. Question. OK. Oh, sure. So again, this is my fault for taking things out of context and assuming that the structure might otherwise be obvious. But you can think of this particular example that we're discussing, bib.xml, as representing a file that looks like this, for instance. So if this is my XML file, there is a, let's say, a bib element here. And inside of that is a book element. And then inside of a book is, what do we call the paragraph, <coughs> one or more paragraph elements. Yes, paragraph elements. That's all we mean. It doesn't have some uh, fundamental meaning. Not, not quite. So this where expression is being evaluated for each of the books, yeah. whereby it's acting as a filter on the books that we actually consider. So for each book, right. where it's the case that there's some paragraph in that book that mentions both of the following words, return the following. No, no, I, oh, OK. I understand. Oh, sure. So if you want to return all the paragraphs about, say, both sailing and windsurfing, you can change the approach here altogether and instead iterate not over the book elements, but iterate over the paragraph elements for each of the books, and then use the if condition that we just saw, if contains wind sa sailing and contains wind surfing, return the following. Okay. Other questions? OK, so just to uh, reassure you that at least the data types in this language don't impose anything else to learn, um, it adopts XML schemas, um, system for data types, which we actually will spend time on in the, in the next two lectures when we look at XML schema in more detail. But um, as is the tendency, it seems, in this world of XML, they've enumerated all possible primitives that you might ever want to use. But they've standardized, the good thing is, uh, things like dates and times and the like, but they went so far as to standardize things with fairly long descriptions like non-positive integer, positive integer, unsigned short, unsigned int, and so forth. The primitives that you have the ability to express in say C and C++ and Java, sometimes with casting, sometimes with different keywords, but they're all very much in there. And there's 40 some odd of these um, data types. But 
fortunately, most of them are uh, you get quite accustomed to when you start specking out XML schemas. Uh, we're doing it. okay. So one more comment, just so that you've seen it, but it's uh, it's the last such uh, example from the recommendation itself. So the neat thing, perhaps, at least if you like languages, is that in XQuery you have the ability to check. Um, you do a bit of introspection and ask an element what it is an instance of. So there is syntax no with an XQuery whereby you can test the values of data, checking whether, for instance, some element A is an instance of an integer. You can do type switching on values, so using similar to Java's own instance of, can you behave differently based on whether a billing address, in this case, is a US address, is a Canadian address, is a Japanese address, or the like. This will make more sense in the context of schema when we look at the fact that in excuse me, XML schema, there's ability not only to declare your own data types, but also to have hierarchies thereof, and actually have nesting, which can be a useful feature for the sake of reusing code and the like. And you can also cast things much like you could in another language, but I won't dwell on the syntax for that. But that's more of a teaser for XML schema, which is to come. Any questions? Yeah. I would say the most similar. So intermingled, do you mean just compared to? Uh, no, I mean, how, how do you treat the SQL and the SQL and what the relationship on it? Oh, so, so again, a lot of DBMSs do support um, XQuery as a query language now, so that if the data stored in your data database can be modeled as XML, for instance, if it's an object oriented database, you can get at that information much like you would get at relational information with SQL, you can get at that information with flower expressions or just more specifically paths. Uh, so it allows you to, um, for instance, just execute a query like quote unquote uh, for X in, uh, you wouldn't say doc if you're actually querying it from a database, but for X in the specific table name, for instance, uh, dive in from the bib element down to the book element, execute this where condition, and then return me these nodes. So you can imagine just putting these queries similar in spirit to what you do with SQL already, embedding them in code or factoring them out into um, files in theory. Um, but I would frankly have to defer to, um, say, the specific DBMS, because I've myself not used it in the context of a real database, but rather I've just played around, say, with XML Spy and the like. So it's only, I mean, as I said, it's only reached recommendation status this past January, and though um, an adoption is very much increasing, but it certainly wasn't the case for some time. Uh, so where would you use Just for previous example, using database, you will never, you will never go to Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it boils down to the question, who cares, right? So, um, I mean, it's good in theory. I mean, good in theory, good conceptually in that it allows you to pull out data that, it, that lends itself to an object-oriented hierarchical relationship. The world had many more years at this point, though, to optimize relational tables, and even though it is not perhaps the best mental model for representing data. Folks have gotten really good at implementing fast database systems and executing SQL queries quickly. So I would say that, th and this is why we actually don't do so much yet in this course hands-on with it, but rather introduce it more at a conceptual and syntactical level, but not with actual um, integration with the projects just yet, um, because um, it, it's much more nascent than a lot of um, the alternatives, namely, say, SQL. So, in fact, I mean, in semesters past, some students have used what are generally called XML databases, which are uh, database engines that represent the data somehow underneath the hood, but they expose it as XML content. And you can query these databases like Eclipse is one, uh, Zindische is another one, or Zindiche. I've never been certain how to pronounce it. But they, they've been in beta format, at least, for the past few years. So even then, it, it's not quite clear. Um, so what you're seeing is folks adopt this in more traditional realms and presenting it as another API for the same data, as in the case of, say, Oracle, or some of BA stuff or the like. So if, if, if you can find more than you do XML files, mm -hmm. why would I use this query instead of Spot or other? Uh, so what was the beginning of the question? Uh, 
Okay. Okay, what are the choices? X query versus? So why use X query versus X path? It depends how expressive you want to be. So X path, at least 1.0 as we've seen, it does allow you to get data, but if you want to do, for the most part, any interesting uh, manipulation of that data, you then need to manipulate it using your style sheet. Right? You need to use XSL for each, or you need to use XSL call template or the like. X query absolutely allows, there's absolutely overlap in what you can do, for instance, with XSLT and XQuery. XQuery integrates far more of the logical control into the query language itself. I dare say much more so than even SQL allows. SQL does allow you to do averaging and uh, tabular joining and the like, but it's more limited um, than um, some of the things you can do, ifs and elfs, for instance, with XQuery. So, Part of it, I think, boils down to a style, um, matter of style, and where you want to implement the code. It's just yet another option. Other questions? Okay, so why don't we take our uh, five-minute break early, and then we'll resume and conclude with our focus on DTD, which is kind of neat. All right, so we're back. So our first and only language that's not actually written in XML itself, but ironically is in the XML 1.0 spec. So DTD is the document type definition. That is the language for specifying a, an XML document structure that shipped with the XML recommendation itself. So in XML 1.0's recommendation, can you find all the gory details over DTD? But let's begin, perhaps, with a quick story. So this files and this uh, XML is an excerpt from Moreover News's newsfeed, and I gave you the root, um, uh, the path below. But this is one of the files with which we provided you. It's a sample XML feed from Moreover, much like the ones you'll be pulling. So in this file, there's clearly a structure. It looks like every article presumably has an ID. Every article has a URL child, a headline text child, a source, dot, 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 and presumably in that order if there's going to be some kind of uh, structure to this file. So how do you go about, so one, this document must be, to be XML itself, well-formed. And recall that well-formed means when you open a quote, you close a quote. When you open a tag, you close a tag. Everything's nicely symmetric, and there are no syntactical errors in the document. Might be completely meaningless data in the document, but syntactically it's correct. Validity, though, is the second half of um, the second thing that's important when processing XML. XML document doesn't just have to be XML. It also, in some applications, needs to look like a certain type of XML. So for instance, iTunes clearly has some kind of XML parser built into it, but that parser is checking not only that every open tag is closed, but also that certain required tags are inside that document, namely those iTunes colon tags. Otherwise, iTunes itself will probably say invalid podcast URL or invalid feed. So how is it doing that? Well, it's relying most likely on some kind of standard for expressing what a uh, iTunes RSS feed must look like, or more generally, what maybe moreover.com's newsfeed must look like. So in fact, this is the DTD that moreover.com uh, distributes for its moreover news elements. So that is to say, any program that wants to validate a feed for moreover and double check that this thing is structured as moreover.com has promised me it would be, so that I can, as we, if you think back to project one, can take a leap of faith and just assume that I can start processing this document and everything I expect to be there is going to be there in a certain order, I can push that responsibility for validation entirely on the parser. I don't need to be putting all that error checking in my own code because it's completely uninteresting if you're coding at that conceptual, uh, in that conceptual level. So how does it work? Well, ugly as it might be, you have in a DTD, which can just be a text file that lives on a web server somewhere, and much like the XML file itself, or it can be dynamically generated, you have declarations for elements using precisely this syntax, open bracket, exclamation point, capital element, it's followed by the name of the element, whose structure you want to define, followed by a content model. In this case, you can kind of guess what the implication is. What does a moreover news element have as its children, apparently? 
yeah, zero or more articles. And it's parenthesized to show that this is actually, um, well, by definition, uh, a list of the following types of children, just an article in this case, zero or more. So now the next item is also declared with bang element, but now we're defining an article. And an article is a sequence of children, URL, headline text, source, media type, cluster, tagline, dot, 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 access status, in that order. And there's no question marks there, there's no stars in this one, nothing. Each of those elements, by implication of this uh, declaration, must be present as children of article. Well, let's recurse. What must, an art, what must a URL look like? Well, here, moreover, starts to cut some corners. At the end of the day, a URL is just some parse character data. So there's no validation at the level of this child any longer, saying that it must begin with HTTP colon slash slash and then meet some regular expression. Unfortunately, <laughs> DTD's expressiveness doesn't take us very far. At the end of the day, you typically have to punt and just rely on something being there. But unfortunately, it turns out my software, if using DTD-based validation, is going to have to use its own library or its own regex for checking that a quote unquote URL is indeed a valid structurally URL. Han, it's about to go. Yeah. Um, you would said for the article the, the elements have to be in the order given in the URL. Is, is there any implication of there, there has to be exactly one of them? Okay. Yes. Okay. So the implication of the fact that they are mentioned only once and there's no star is that they must be present exactly one time. Good question. And we can specify that. Let me come back to that in just a moment, this distinction between empty and non-empty elements. And let's just fast forward, skim through these. Turns out we punted on all the others. They've got to be there, but don't really care, can't really express what's got to be there as children of these children. That is, the text child children can just be anything, zero or more characters. But now let's scroll back to at list. So you can also specify what attributes an element might must have, and you specify it with that Syntax, at list, followed by the element's name, followed by the attribute's name, followed by the attribute's type. We'll see a list in a moment of the valid types, not that many, followed by some kind of qualifier like implied, which uh, means in this case that it's, excuse me, optional. But we'll elaborate on that in just a moment. All right, so just to contextualize this further, what does it mean if your website is valid such and such, valid XHTML transitional, valid HTML 4.01, valid XHTML 1.0 strict, all of these things where you see silly sites saying we are uh, XHTML something valid. Well, that just means, in theory, that their site is in perfect accordance with the W3C's recommendation, that is specification, for XHTML 1.0 something or other, or HTML, something or other. So that just means that they've run, in theory, their source code, their HTML, through some kind of validator that looks at documents, DTDs like this, conceptually, but obviously specialized for the HTML documents, and double checks that every one of the elements that's got to be in that person's web page is, in fact, there. And if not, they should not be claiming that it's valid, although those buttons on web pages are pretty meaningless in the, in the end of the day. But this is, just to illustrate a point, the smallest web page, maybe with ever so slight tweaks of white space and the like, maybe uh, ele uh, attributes, the smallest possible web page that is valid XHTML 1.0 tra uh, tr transitional. So it turns out that even if it's empty, the XHTML spec, if you really want to be uptight about it, must have a title element and it must have a body element, even if they are empty. So this is just, again, to illustrate a point that there is some DTD, apparently called XHTML1-transitional.dtd, um, that um, is the definition for this actual this language. OK, so who cares? What's it all about? So this is really the formal language that's, OK, so let's summarize this as follows. So DTD is not nearly as expressiveness of the, as the stuff, XML schema, that we'll look at in the next two weeks. But they're still quite popular. They're quick and dirty. They tend to get the job done. Uh, and they're clearly what's being used by browsers and the like to validate some uh, very common standards. So with that said,
why. So the nice thing about validation is, again, you can factor out a lot, but maybe not all, error checking, where you can just trust that the data your program is about to be passed has already been validated. For instance, you with moreover.com. If you make the assumption that moreover's newsfeed has already been um, validated for you, you don't need to constantly check if the attribute is present, do this. If URL is present, do this. You can just assume that it will be present, because if it's not, that document was not valid. But to be clear, you do have to turn on validation. So by default, XML par pros uh, parsers tend not to validate, unless you turn a switch that says validate against the DTD. And we'll see how to do that with Xerxes in just a moment. Um, why else? Um, one, it's a way, why else are DTDs useful? It's a way of just specifying what data types you're talking about. So recently, I was actually working on a data integration project with another IT team. And I needed to, we just wanted to put in writing exactly what kind of data we're talking about. What's my data going to look like? What's their gonna, data going to look like? We could have done it reasonably well by just giving examples. Here's an example of what my data is going to look like. Go infer from this what we're talking about. But this is just a language, if nothing else, that allows you to express precisely and formally what standard you're actually agreeing upon for the exchange of data and for maybe real world systems where precision is key, that's a good thing. For instance, there are actually, actually some documented standards like DocBook and OFX and Voice XML and many others certainly exist that are just DTDs that a bunch of folks have agreed upon represent, for instance, a book in XML format or a financial document in OFX format and the like. They're standards because folks have agreed upon them and they've been specified in DTD. Um, why? Do or why not? So just some reasons here. Um, certainly this is one of those things that depends. And even though ironically we introduced them in the context of Project 3, there's also something a little silly about validating if you don't need to, right? So yes, it's nice to assume that moreover, yes, it's nice to assume that you're validating data from moreover.com. But frankly, if moreover is generating it, it's a pretty fair assumption that they're going to generate it in accordance with their own DTD. So why should you bother? parsing the whole document, validating the whole document before you even look at the data. So in fact, with moreover, we'll actually suggest that you turn off validation, because there's little point to validating the data again and again and again. But that's a safe assumption for a course's project, maybe not a safe assumption in general. Um, standardizing, just what you're going to call things. So this is a simple little example. Talking about the notion of price, well, maybe you think of it as cost as well. It's just a way of standardizing what the tags are going to be called that you're talking about. So this is why, actually, in Project 3, we show you the DTD for Moreover, because it's just the means by which you can express what you, the student, what you, the programmers, should expect as your data, sort of the way to do it. Um, think of a UML, for instance, in data modeling, say, a program structure. Here's a way of expressing it without actually writing the code or giving you an infinite number of examples how we might implement the code a way of expressing it. So now let's look at a more random example, this time from Dave Matthews. So if this is uh, a Dave Matthews song, uh, clearly there's a whole bunch of metadata associated with this. Uh, before turning the page, what do you think, how do you think we might go about representing this thing with a DTD? Get me, oh, I saw someone turning the page. Hopefully back. <laughs> So the DTD, what's the first element we might define here? Song. All right, so we might define song. So bang element. OK, song. And help them just uh, white space is largely irrelevant, so I'll go move down here. What's a song look like? It's got, it's got a title, and it is all case sensitive. Title followed by composer. composer. And because we're probably all on the same page at this point in the story, Oh, good. So, star, okay. Anything? Uh, producer, okay, good. So, producer, and actually the rest I think are publisher. Adams, publisher. Okay, so dot, 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 artist. Good. Okay, so now we can recurse conceptually, though to be clear, even though we plucked off song first, and even though in the previous example I plucked off um, the element called. Moreover, news first. There's actually no order in DTDs. Conceptually, to be clean, I've tried with our own examples to start from the root element on downward. 
but you could put them anywhere, so long as one of them matches and is present somewhere in the DTD. Order is irrelevant. Uh, so if we were going to declare something like length, that's an interesting one. So bang element, element called length. Uh, whoops, length. What's length look like? PC data, which is actually unfortunate because if there's ever opportunities for validating data, it's when you have things that are structured, like a timestamp or a duration or a year. But unfortunately, we kind of have to just leave it with DTD as PC data. So again, gets the job done, but not incredibly thoroughly. Still leaves a bit of work for the programmer to do because that could be the word foo. And my program is going to have to check, is my program actually backslash d, backslash d, colon, backslash d, backslash d, in terms of regular expressions, as opposed to something else. Is yeah? There, is there any way to represent that in uh, the DTD? I mean, it needs to be able to say, okay, pc data, colon, no. Short answer, no. So is there any way to do better? No, not with DTD. But XML schema does redress this with a very heavy-handed solution. And in fact, though we'll look at D, uh, XML schema, in the next couple of weeks, I'll also make mention of at least one other alternative called RelaxNG, which is not a spec from the W3C, but it's a very popular alternative to schema in that it's more expressive than DTD, but is much simpler and much lighter weight. It's similar in spirit for those of you who have played around to the JDOM API. A while back, I mentioned not only the W3Cs and in turn the JAXP DOM API, which is kind of kludgy. You have to walk yourself through nodes in a very clunky way. JDOM is similar in spirit in that it allows you to model XML document as a tree, but it just gives you methods that allow you to get at your data without jumping through as many hoops. For instance, in the DOM model, to get at your children, you start with one child, and then you move through a linked list effectively. JDOM lets you just dive in and get those children more easily without having to do that kind of navigation yourself. So that kind of spirit, there are alternatives, but I digress. So let's uh, summarize this. So it turns out you can use the plus. So we can specify one or more artists, if that were appropriate, though it wasn't for this example. Year might be optional. Length might be optional, just because I put forth. And you can express that with the question mark. So all of the syntax is borrowed from hopefully familiar regular expression syntax. So just to formalize what's going on here, so every XML declaration looks something like that. And I used the jargon before, like content model, but what does that actually mean? So a uh, couple points to make. So the names of these elements must be unique. Um, that should make sense, at least conceptually, if we're trying to standardize what these things look like. Let's avoid ambiguity. Uh, the content model can be different things. So it can either be PC data. We've certainly seen that. If you want to express the notion of an empty element, you specify this, that is, the course element, according to this DTD element declaration, must be empty, can't have content, otherwise the document's invalid. It can have elements nested inside of it, and we've seen that just by enumerating with them with commas. Uh, it can be mixed. Uh, that will come to in just a moment, actually. Uh, yeah, we'll come back to that in just a moment. It can be mixed, which means it can have both PC data and element children. So again, recall, we've talked about content models before in the context of, uh, I guess, DOM way back when. What can you have as your content, or rather, when we talked about XML, what's the content model? It's either empty, it's got children, those children are elements, maybe they're ch elements with PC data. All of that is the same, because we're talking again about XML. Or it can be any, where you really punt and say a comment is whatever, and it can have anything nested inside of it. Let's dive a bit deeper. So in this case here, um, we had element content that looked like this. So we can also have element that might look like this, where a spec might have a front, a body, and a back to it, where the back is optional. Arbitrary example, but just illustrates a shorter list. And now we can actually have some kind of nesting here, too. So if you're trying to express the, the notion of a division, like div in an HTML sense, conceptually, well, a division might have a head followed by zero or more paragraphs or lists or notes, followed by zero or more div2 elements. And again, it doesn't really matter so much what these things look like. The point of this snippet is just to make clear that you can have these nested content models if you want to qualify some of them with their own regular expressions. So you can do that as well, though perhaps not all that common. 
Uh, for those unfamiliar, just know that these are the building blocks of a regular expression. We've just seen question mark, star, and plus. Know that you can do or as well, so that you can choose from a list of possible uh, elements, or you can enumerate them with a comma, which specifies order uh, specifically. It must be foobar baz if the order is given as such. OK, so mixed content. So mixed content, though maybe a little ugly, actually makes perfect sense for something like HTML, where you're absolutely intermingling PC data all the time with element content. The means by which you express that is to say that a paragraph, say in HTML, is either PC data or an anchor or underline or bold or italics or emphasized zero or more times. It's a mini version of HTML or mini version of the paragraph element, but that gets the job done. The catch, though, is that for mixed content, if you're going to do this, PC data must be the first thing specified, just because. So if you have mixed content, it's got to be the first thing. And here's a more crazy example, just to illustrate what else you could do, even if nonsensical. If for some reason you wanted to tag an English sentence or paragraph with metadata, as you might in, the, in HTML, but really in the semantic web, perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps in the future. Um, you can specify that a PO, a purchase order, is mixed. And that might be useful so that you can have this sentence, which aesthetically displays to the user as human prose or English prose, but there are semantically tied snippets in there. So, but I think the paragraph example in the previous bullet is more compelling, just to illustrate what we mean by that. OK, so what's this look like? So if you want to specify that an element's got some list of zero or more attributes, you use the attribute list. We saw this in action with just one attribute earlier, the ID. Well, let's dive a bit deeper. If we want to specify that a term definition uh, has an ID attribute, type attribute, and name attribute, and here, too, is where the syntax gets pretty sloppy, frankly, because the white space here is pretty meaningless, too, um, all the indentation and such. This is saying that the term def element in some document uh, must have an ID attribute whose type is ID. Come back to that in a moment. And it is, in fact, required. It's also going to have a type attribute, which is C data, that is character data, uh, that's required. And it's got to have, it's got, has, can have an optional name whose value is also just C data. Hmm? Question? Why, why, why not something like option or, or something like Can I go with just because? <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Uh, you got me. Um, what about a list? So just to consider another example, you can enumerate possible values for an attribute. So this is saying that the element known as list must have the following attributes. Well, just one, a type whose value can be bullets or ordered or glossy, glossary, but the default, if not specified explicitly, is going to be ordered. So this is a neat trick. You can use DTDs, and we'll see schemas, to insert values into a document so that if they're not there, they'll be put there. So that you can, again, make these assumptions yourself that the data you're being fed has certain data within them. If we instead take this approach, saying that the form element uh, must have an attribute called method whose, uh, whose type is C data, but it must be fixed as post. So what this is saying is that reject any document that I try to parse that has an element called form, who has an attribute called method, whose value is anything other than post. So this might be a heavy-handed way of preventing your program, for whatever reason, from parsing forms that are going to submit via the get method. So maybe this is some crazy overzealous browser that just doesn't want to show you any web page where there might be this relative insecurity of using get versus post, because information will be leaked in the URL. I just made that off of the top of my head, but it's more to illustrate the expressiveness here. All right, what about finally? At, uh, paper element has a language attribute of type C data. And in this case, uh, English is the default. It's not fixed at that, but it's the, it can be anything. But the default, if not present, will be English, is the implication of that one. Mm -hmm. Not required and not implied. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, right. So 
optional, implied. Let me think for a moment. C data language is present. Oh, okay, so I think I actually misspoke because there is a distinction. So I, what I should have said, I believe, for paper is that paper must have, if paper has an attribute called language, it must be English. But it's not required that it be there. But it can't be anything else. That's the distinction here. What's the distinction between the, the dollar sign text? Is that saying it must be there and it must be post? Yes. So that's saying it's got to be here and it's got to be post. This is saying, if it's there, it's got to be English. This is saying, it doesn't even have to be there. It's saying even less. Is there a way to do just a general default, like saying paper can be any language, but if it's, just, if it's missing, just default it to English? That would be this one. Would you stick a word in there? I mean, you could stick a word in there, and then it would have to be something. And then it would have to be there. Right. So what this is saying, uh, oh wait, did I just, I didn't yeah, let, oh, did, I think I just did again. Okay, so let me retract, roll back on my head here. There, it must be English. So the scenario you're describing is that if it's not there, So that okay. So let me roll, but let me restate this and see if I'm consistent with myself. Okay. So this is saying that language can be anything, but if it's not there, it's English. Yes. That's identical in spirit to this one, but which is being more precise than C data. It's saying a list, uh, if it's uh, if it's there, has to be bullets, ordered, or glossary. <laughs> Otherwise, its default is going to be ordered. This is implying that name doesn't even have to be there. This is implying that ID and type has to be there. So ignore everything I just said. Let me clear the slate, and what I just said is accurate. But if I took out the hash implied there, okay. it would be the same thing as C-data English. Uh, see, well, if we have eliminated this altogether, that would just mean that name can be anything of type C-data. That it has to be there, but it can be anything. Oh, it means that it oh. has to be there, but it can be there. No, no, I'm, damn, what is the default? I'm gonna, let me take the fifth. I'm going to have to double check so I don't completely misspeak to check if the default is for attributes is required or implied. Let me not mislead. OK, I will get back to you on that. And if I don't, just ask me via the listserv. Or better yet, look it up in the recommendation and tell you, David, here's what you forgot to look up. <laughs> OK, sorry for the confusion. OK, so a quick glance at these, just because there, there is a limited typing system, but it is pretty weak. C data is just character data, with including entities and such, that won't get parsed because we're talking C data, not PC data. So they get passed through unchanged. ID, so this one's useful in spirit, but kind of stupid in practice. So it must be unique within the document. So that's saying if uh, you specify that some element has to have an ID, an attribute called whatever, but that's of type ID, the value of that ID must be unique in the document. And that's useful, because that's a way of enforcing primary keys effectively on your input document. The catch, and this is where I think it's unfortunate, is that it must start, OK, I even put a smi uh, sad face, it must start with a letter, which is completely inconsistent with almost every ID that a human tends to use, a programmer tends to use, especially when you're pulling them from databases. So as such, it renders them less useful. Okay? Unfortunate catch. Right, I mean, if you've ever used a primary key in a database, odds are it's an int of some sort, not a string starting with some uh, letter. So an ID ref, and won't dwell on these, but there is only because there are better, there are other ways to do this, and arguably even when people do use DTD, they don't bother getting to this level of detail. ID ref means you can say that this attribute's value's got to refer to an existing ID value elsewhere in the document. Uh, ID refs, this is kind of an ugly hack that XML employs once in a while, where same idea, it's got to be, a, uh, the, a, an, a re, it's gotta be uh, equivalent to an actual ID that appears elsewhere in the document, but it can be a list of them 
separated by white space. And this, again, is where XML gets kind of sloppy. So if all you have to express yourself is a pair of double quotes, the best you can do to express multiple values sometimes is just string them all together, separated by white space. Uh, entity just says whatever's here in this value has got to be an entity um, or multiple entities. Oh, entity? That, just that. That kind of stuff. Ampersand something, semicolon, or the numeric codes thereof. Um, an NM token is, is more useful. It's a little more constraining than C data in that it says it's got to be a token, a one word something or other. So that's useful if at least you want it to be some atomic value that doesn't have any white space within it. But as we've seen, it's not uncommon to just use C data for most of these things because the fact of the matter is that. Um, you only have limited control over their structure anyway. Oh, huh. I solved my own, answered my own question. OK, so fixed means, OK, fixed is the obvious. So doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, does that really answer? No, it doesn't. Yeah, if you don't mention it, what's, impl what's implied? All right, so all right, I'll still get back to you or you me. Um, but that just summarizes what we, I think we all knew to be correct, or at least uh, obvious. OK, so where did Digitigus go? So now let's answer the how question. So two different places. Either you can include the DTD within the XML document itself so that it's completely self capable of self-validation, in a sense, so long as someone does the processing. Or you can reference it, say, on the local file system, factoring it out to a file called foo.dtd. So the jargon here is that it's either an internal subset, that it's in the XML itself, or it's an external subset. It's in a separate file. So how do we make use of this? Well, let's take a look at our examples 8 directory. And let's take a look at sax. Um, let's take a look at song1.xml. So this is a file that contains that Dave Matthews element, uh, song element. And notice that inside of the same XML document have I nested the doc type declaration at the top of the file. And notice that what I've done here is rather than specify a file name, I've specified in brackets, square brackets, all of the following is the DTD for this document. So the question on the table is, how do I validate this XML to be sure that it's consistent, that is valid with respect to that DTD? All right, let's actually apply one to the other and validate this document. Well, how can we do that? Well, we've seen a few SAX demos over the weeks that I've coded up, usually extending default handler. And that's all I'm going to do again. So just to give you a sense of the size of this program, it's pretty short. And in fact, most of the code here is just for error handling conditions. Notice that I've implemented fatal error, warning, and error, which might be familiar to you already, but we borrowed the same structure even for project one, even though we simplified it. So I'm going to scroll back up to the beginning of the program here. So in main, I grab from argv the name of a file that I want to validate. So it's a quick and dirty test program. I'm going to instantiate a SAX parser factory. We've done that before in our SAX code. I'm going to now make one line of code that we haven't seen before. I'm going to set validating to true on that factory. And what that means is that the factory just spit out not only an XML parser, but one who has validation turned on, which means if the parser detects a DTD, inside the file being parsed or referenced as a local file on the local file system, then it will validate it against that content. But all these lines of code are identical to what we've seen before. And the interesting line that kickstarts everything is this one. So the only change is set validating equals tr uh, true. All right, so let's run this. Java sax validator on song1.xml. Nothing. That's good. None of those error handling routines got called. So let's break this thing. So in song one, uh, suggest how I might break this so that the doc's no longer valid. OK. All right, I'll go with the thing I heard first. Leave out the title. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to save it. I'm going to rerun it. All right, so now we get a parsing error at line 22, character 8. So the validator, the Xerxes, is not bad at figuring out where the error went wrong. And it decided to trigger a parsing error, not necessarily a fatal parsing error. right? Even back in project one, I think we discussed, I think via the listserv, what's the best way to handle an error? Do you bail out immediately? Do you keep forging ahead? And the short answer is it depends. 
Um, Xerxes defines what we encountered as a non-fatal error. So my code just printed it out and left it at that. But in theory, I could have just bailed immediately and or handled it in some other way. I just wanted to print the error message. So we know why this code is broken. Let's try another problem. Uh, if I go back, uh, let's just do something stupid like this. So is this valid? No, is this well formed? So neither now. So let's see what happens. So run this. OK, so now we get a parse exception. So not only do we get um, a fatal parser warning, we also get an exception thrown because Xerxes is designed to actually check for well-formedness, even irrespective of validation whatsoever. So that's just an error of well-formedness. What about this? If I uh, get rid of artist, all right, what's that going to do for us? Yeah, OK, so we need to declare it, right? If we specified it in the list for the song elements children, we've got to declare it. Let's try breaking this one, two composers. Let's don't allow that, OK? So I got rid of the plus sign. So now only one composer is allowed. Another parsing error, OK? So illustrative of exactly what we've been talking about. Let me take a look at song2.xml, same thing. But now notice I've changed the syntax to reference not a square bracket followed by the DTD itself, but the, or followed by the declarations themselves, but song.dtd, which, as you might guess, is just a file locally that has that same stuff. But Xerxes, because it parses XML and it knows about internal and external subsets, knows that if I go ahead and parse song2, that's going to work just fine as well, unless I break the DTD and or XML document. So the takeaway, long story short, is that uh, with Xerxes, or more generally with JAXP, turning on DTD validation, simple as one line of code. And then you can start using DTDs. Let's try this, though. Uh, song 2. I'm not going to break things per se, but I'm just going to get rid of the mention of a DTD. And let's see what happens, even though I'm telling it to validate. OK, so now there's no grammar found, which is saying there's no DTD, even though I turn on validation. So that's a good thing, too. Figured out that my DTD was missing altogether, or specification thereof. So this is a fun question to answer at this point, because we finally have the means of expressing it. All that talk that we had over time about white space, why is it the case that some white space is significant, and why is it ignorable? Even in a simple example like this, is that document, uh, how many children does Foo have, do you think? Six. Ooh, OK. Uh, oh, you overbid. So not six. So, well, actually, is that fair? No, no, we could make that argument, actually, especially if we did not normalize the DOM. So I'll take that, sure. So Foo has either. I was hoping someone would just say two, because it makes for a better story. So Bar and Baz are clearly children. So yes, it has two children, unless white space is significant. That is, it's not ignorable. In which case, there's also, as a child, a foo, a backslash n, and then maybe two spaces, or maybe a tab, whatever the indentation is. So there could be other nodes as well. And I say it could have been uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, it could have been six if each of those spaces, white space characters, got its own node. So I think you're all right. Ah, perfect class. So how do we actually answer this definitively? Well, let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at uh, significant white space. So significant white space is just that silly example, foo bar baz, but I have an internal subset up there that says that a foo uh, a doc type foo incidentally means this is a DTD for a document whose root element is foo. So that's really the way of kickstarting the whole process. And then all of our elements get declared therein. So foo can be any, have any content model. Don't really care. Put whatever there. But bar and baz must be empty because I didn't want to let this process go on forever. So that's it. So the implication is that foo's content model can be element only, which suggests Ignorable white space, or what's the alternative that would suggest significant white space? What content model might Foo have mixed? So mixed content, and again, not to dwell on jargon too much, mixed content just means it can have PC data and or elements. But white space is PC data, which means in that case, this document could have um, 
valid white space node. So let's go ahead and run uh, white space demo. Have a C on white space demo on this file. What is white space demo? White space demo is similarly just an extension of default handler whereby I turned on validation again. So, so thus far the code's identical through SAX validator. And now notice what I've done is if you recall my SAX demo, I think SAX demo one from way, or maybe SAX demo two from way back when, where I just, and the code's ugly because I printed out my pseudocode like expression for SAX events. It's ugly, but the only difference then between this and SAX demo one or SAX demo two, whichever it was, is that I turned on validation. So if you were comfortable with SAX demo one and two way back when, same thing with validation on. The point is that now this should make clear whether or not white space is being ignored or not based on that DTD. So with that said, if I run white space demo, which has validation on, on that file called significant white space, which had an any content model for the foo element, what should I see printed? If you recall my pseudocode for SACUS events, how many different SACUS events will get called? So start document, then what? Start element foo, or was there a debate? No? OK, start element foo. Then? Uh, characters, either one or two or three times, probably, followed by start element bar, end element bar, more characters, and dot, dot, dot. Let's finish the tale with code, indeed. So there are, indeed, characters events thrown or triggered because that white space is significant because if foo has any content model, it might have PC content, that is uh, mixed character content, mixed content, in which case all that white space is valid because it's allowed within its definition, so you better pass it along to the SAX events. So by default, recall, this is what SAX demo one used to look like. It was a mess whenever we had white space because by default, if you do not provide a DTD to a parser, everything per project one spec, is significant. It should make no assumptions. But now let's make some assumptions and clean this thing up. In ignorable white space.xml, same XML, but now I'm explicitly saying that a foo is just a bar followed by a baz child. No room in there for character content. Now, it's a bit of a white lie because XML is meant to be human readable. Humans like to indent, insert white space. So it's a bit of a white lie and that absolutely is their PC data inside of foo. But the implication is that white space is a special instance thereof and that's perfectly okay. We can't put the words ABC in there even though that's uh, PC data as well. White space is a special case but it is now allowed but if there, it's going to be ignored. If I run white space demo now on ignorable white space, notice now that everything gets prettied up. And none of those characters events are fired because the parser ignores what is otherwise white space in an element only content model. Whew. Long explanation of white space. But at this point, it actually is kind of interesting because if you understand the nuances at that point, frankly, I think you're in excellent shape with, with most of this stuff, certainly. All right, so just some similar XML constructs, just to toss them out there. Uh, there's this notion of entities. You can, in fact, define them. Some of you have done so in your style sheets, even though stylus is a little loose when it comes to uh, entities. Some of you have had to define these things for Zalin's sake. So if, how do you declare an entity? It's pretty similar in structure to these DTD declarations. Looks like that stuff up there. This is another thing you could use uh, entities for if you want to have constants of sorts in your XML document, whereby any time hereafter you do ampersand copyright semicolon, the effect but from a parser is to paste that same content everywhere. So that's another use of it, if you will, if a, if a bit of an abuse. Um, there's also this notion of a notation where you can reference binary data, but I'll wave my hand at that um, as being beyond the scope of things we tend to do. Yeah? Actually, one trick um, mm. that I've, I've seen used before, I used myself, is, okay. is you use the trick to find things like copyright. Mm -hmm. um, entities, you, you can use that to internationalize or localize. Oh, that's quite true. 
that's nice actually. You could absolutely do that and you just include the, the appropriate file that has those, those definitions. Yeah, I like that actually, quite compelling. All right, so seems to be pretty useful overall. What are the catches or the shortcomings here? So one, it is kind of lame that DTD is not in XML itself because it means anyone, even yourselves in Project One, had you gone about implementing a DTD parser, you'd have to write not only your XML parser, but a DTD. That just seems contrary to the whole purpose of using XML in the first place, but such was the case. Um, no built-in data types. That's more problematic when you actually care about validation. There's no means of expressing with precision what the data should look like, not even in terms of regular expressions, but also just in terms of primitives, what they look like underneath the hood. There's no support for custom data types. That's even more useful when you're trying to confine your data to be of some certain form. Um, no pattern matching, inheritance, and the like. No support for ranges. Another very humble request. I just want to ensure that the years start in 2000 and go upwards, and I don't support anything below that, for instance. Can't do it. Um, no na not namespace aware. This is even more problematic. In this, war in this day, we're even uh, increasingly our XML um, namespaces being intermingled. In case of iTunes, for instance, RSS in general, even some of the stuff we've done in class with XSLT meets SVG meets XHTML gets very messy quickly if you can't distinguish one node from another based on its namespace. DTD just applies to anything named as follows. Um, Finally, and this is more of a theoret well, this is also um, a reasonable request, but it's conceptually interesting. It seems very reasonable, I would say, to want to require that Foo have three children, Bar, Baz, and Quux, but you don't care about the order. You just want them to be there. You, the programmer, don't care what order they appear in so long as you get the data at the end of the day. Oh, dramatic PowerPoint. Can't do it. So you would think that you could just use the syntax we've seen today and say foo can be bar baz quux, or it can be bar quux baz, or it can be baz bar quux, or the other possible um, permutations of those three children. So granted, that very quickly becomes tedious for more than just three nodes because you have to sit there enumerating all possible orderings. The problem, though, is you're not even allowed to do that. Even though you can express it syntactically, this is no longer a deterministic content model. So those of you who like or have taken courses like Computer Science E207 here or any Theory of Computation course, uh, DTD's content models are meant to be or should be uh, or meant required to be deterministic, which means you should be able to validate by way of a, a DFA, a state machine. And unfortunately, if you have content models like bar baz quux or bar quux baz, what that means in terms of a state machine, if you're familiar with this notion, is that once you start parsing foo's children and you say, ah, here's a bar child, then you proceed to the next step. You're not, it's not obvious to the machine if it should go this direction or that direction because you are in this ambiguous state where you can fork off in two different ways. And that's unacceptable from DTD's perspective. Content models must be deterministic. So this is yet another nail in the proverbial coffin. I mean, this is a pretty long laundry list of non-nitpicky points of things you can't do with DTD, even though in spirit, DTD was a great place to start. And it's we hear that we leave off for next week when we look finally at XML schema, which does this and more, perhaps to a fault, but nonetheless, we'll be able to do more with it. So with that said, I'll stick around for questions, but we'll officially adjourn here.